It is now my pleasure to welcome this afternoon's keynote speaker, the Honorable Mark Esper. Secretary Esper became Secretary of the Army in 2017. Now, before that, he was the Senior Executive at Raytheon and the COO and Executive Vice President of the Aerospace Industries Association. He's also held high-profile positions on the Hill, in the Pentagon, and with DC think tanks. He graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1986, receiving his commission in the infantry, and served on active duty. He served with the 101st Airborne during Operation Desert Storm. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary of the Army, Secretary Mark Esper. We have a, a few questions uh, that we'd like to get your opportunity to provide some thoughts on. Great. Then do I get to eat? <laughs> Sir, and they're easy ones, too. So uh, I'll start with the housing issue in the wake of the congressional hearings on, uh, on post housing earlier this year. Uh, can you update the Army's efforts to ensure the soldiers and their families have high quality ho housing choices where they are assigned, both on post and off post? Yeah, no, absolutely. Clearly, uh, you know, what the conditions that families have been living in are unacceptable, completely unacceptable. And so what we try to do is, as soon as we identify the problem, really jump on it immediately, take the lead, and figure out what the full scope of the problem is. So uh, when it's first broke in the March time frame, or so, we initiated a number of actions, nearly two dozen that began with town halls, setting up 1-800 numbers, uh, engaging with the RCI contractors, uh, visiting posts. So at this point, I've probably been to a dozen posts, walked through a few dozen homes, meeting with families and spouses. And uh, we have a crisis action team that has stood up and uh, to this date continues to work. And I think where we are at this point is uh, really moving into the hard part of this challenge, the hard part being having just met with the CEOs of the companies about four weeks ago, fine-tuning the, the uh, Tenant Bill of Rights uh, that embody about 15 or so core principles, and then as we finalize those in the next month or so, making sure that those principles get translated into a new tenant lease agreement that protects uh, our residents, that gives them the means by which they can uh, dispute uh, issues of quality, by which they can facilitate work order uh, by which they can challenge fees that are imposed, et cetera. So I think that hard work is next. The big picture, though, is the Army needs to get back into the business of uh, inspecting barracks, visiting homes, and staying engaged, even with our families who are off post, to make sure that uh, wherever they live, that they're being taken care of, they're being watched over, and that we serve there as a third party that can help them in, in any case. So building that back into our culture at the end of the day is where I want to make sure we end up a year, two years from now, going forward. That, to me, is the best way that we prevent this from ever happening again. Sure. So the administration's fiscal year 2020 budget request includes significant increases from any Department of Defense programs. Can you tell us what the Army's top budget and force structure priorities are? And uh, how can communities and military installations be better prepared to support your efforts? Well, there, uh, as I've been apt to say, there's a renaissance underway in the Army. It affects everything we do from how we man and train the force to how we equip, lead, and organize it. And I think it's the one that involves the equipping side that has rightly drawn the most attention. What we're trying to do now is take the legacy force of the 1980s, the force that I grew up with when I left the academy in 1986, and leap ahead to the technologies we need to fight and win against either the Russians or the Chinese in 2028 and beyond. So those six modernization priorities that reflect a, uh, a few dozen technologies that are critical to us are is top of the list for me, number one. Uh, number two, of course, is readiness uh, with regard to the current force in terms of how we train, uh, how we educate our, our soldiers, and that involves extending basic training, that involves uh, fully uh, uh, resourcing our combat training center rotations, uh, home station training, all those things. And uh, while I would call this third, it's more important to say it's an enduring commitment. And they, the enduring commitment is to our soldiers and their families. And for me, what's been very important to me is make sure we, we really uh, source child care the way it needs to be sourced for, for our families, for our spouses. This is a topic I talk about everywhere I go, that we continue to invest in our housing and in our infrastructure. Um, we, we need to have continue to do more, although it's not a budget item per se, on spousal employment, which is something that's very important to me. And all those other things that deal with soldiers and families that we can source in a budget, that's where I want to make sure we have good, strong funding there 
And that, that is a variety of, it's, it's a combination of extra money in some cases or just reforming what's happening within those budget lines. We'll come back to that at the end, but that's the message to leave with communities, sure. is that's where the, the priority that the Army needs the communities to help most with. Yeah, no, absolutely, particularly with spousal hiring. I mean, it's a, my wife was a military spouse, and the biggest challenge she had was getting a, a, a job that met her professional aspirations that, uh, that, that also suited her background to make sure she could have employment. And she suffered from discrimination, frankly, and what you tend to find with our spouses is they are overqualified and underemployed. So to the degree that we can work between the military and our off-base employers to, uh, to help employ our spouses, that would be a, a fantastic move forward. So uh, later on this afternoon, we're going to have a panel on uh, what's being called the military-civilian uh, divide. And about three weeks ago, we were both in Columbia, South Carolina on the same day. I was presenting them with their Great American Defense Community Award. You were addressing the civilian aides to the Secretary of the Army. Right. And um, I think one of the topics that you addressed with them was the recruiting challenge yeah. that you're having. Or at least that's what the CASA came back and told me, is we need to get better at our recruiting. So do you see this, this military-civilian divide as being real, or is it perceived? And if it is real, uh, how is it affecting recruitment, recruitment, and how can the communities help bridge that divide? Yeah. So it's a very good point and a very important issue for me. Different people divide, define divides different ways. For me, the divide is a, an a, a civilian population and a, the military that protects them moving in opposite directions in, in many ways. And so it's most noticeable for the Army in terms of our recruiting. Um, if you look at our recruiting, 71% uh, of America's youth do not qualify to serve for any number of reasons, uh, physical fitness, medical readiness, intellectual, behavioral, whatnot. But if you look at that same cohort, and you ask yourself, how many of them are both qualified to serve and have a proclivity to serve? It's less than 4%, probably smaller than that. So now we have a military, uh, at least an army, where you have a, a, a million young men and women defending the other 329 million people. And what makes our, there are a number of things that makes recruiting for the army hard. One of them is that, uh, uh, one of them is the lack of qualified kids. Uh, and then the proclivity issue. And the proclivity to serve is related directly to the simple fact that unlike in my day, your day, uh, I grew up with uh, aunts and uncles who served in World War II, uh, with uh, aunts and uncles who fought in the Korean War, with cousins maybe who fought in Vietnam, or in any case, simply served, and who would talk about the benefits of military service, what they learned, what they liked and disliked, all those things. But to many Americans, that the military is a strange thing their only understanding of it is what's been defined and portrayed to them in movies, which are more often than not inaccurate. And, and so what you, what you have is a, a generation of young Amer Americans who aren't inclined to serve because they don't know enough about it. Uh, and their parents, who are the biggest influencers, don't know as much anymore either. So it is my big concern. That's While, while we've looked at recruiting and how do we close, uh, how do we make sure we meet our recruiting goals, uh, one of the two dozen or so things we've done is uh, get back into America's top 22 cities. Uh, we call them the Focus 22. And go recruit America's youth where they are. And in many cases, these are uh, 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 parts of the country where we don't see heavy recruiting. So I, I've been to Pittsburgh and Cleveland. I've been to Boston. I've been to LA. Uh, I've been to a number of cities that, uh, that are part of that Focus 22 and will continue to do so. Because we really need to reach out to America's youth. We can't just uh, sit back on our hills and accept things the way they are. But we need to go out and talk to the American people. And I think you'll see that as we roll out new commercials and, and other uh, media engagement, how we're trying to do that and, and touch them and make sure they understand the great opportunities that service will bring them, a tuition, a well-paying job, a 401k, if you will, retirement, uh, skills training that you can immediately translate back into a civilian occupation if you decide to serve only three years. But that's where my focus is in terms of the, the bigger picture. So in, in February 2018, you and the other service secretary signed off on a letter to the National Governors Association uh, with your concerns about K-12 through education and obviously the spouse licensing. We've heard you talk about spouse licensing, but if I'd like to kind of focus on the, the, the K-12 education, hundreds of defense communities and states out here today, that is their purview. So you've got a captive audience here. So. Are those initiatives, but specifically K-12 education, are they going in the right direction that you want? Um, and what is your message to the Army communities here today? Sure. Well, you know, like uh, many of us, all of us, uh, people tend to choose uh, where they live based on schools, if you have school-aged children. 
And what we find in the military is that uh, our service members are no different. So they choose locations and certainly whether they're going to be on base or off base uh, based on the schools in large part. Um, it, it depends on where you go uh, around the country, around the uh, military. Now, now I can speak for both the, for the Navy and Air Force as well, that there is a, you know, a, a wide range of um, uh, school options out there for kids. And uh, that's one of the biggest concerns I hear from uh, parents as I go out and speak with them is the concern of, in, in some cases, the quality of DOD schools or the quality of schools outside the gate. And that really, it drives not just uh, uh, where they choose, to, uh, to, to locate as a military family, but their satisfaction with military service overall. And that's what concerns me, is we gotta bring the schools up to a common higher standard. That's number one. Number two, what we need is reciprocity in terms of accepting other schools' standards. So I hear this often where a, uh, a military family who's moved a few times when their child is in, a, in, in high school, that they may fall short of requirements because they just came from Texas, and in Texas they learned about Texas state history. They come to Virginia, and Virginia doesn't care about Texas state history. They want you to learn about Virginia state history. I'm making this up, so don't go tell the governors. <laughs> uh, but that's what you get, and so the kids are falling short in terms of credits, even though they've, they, they've done all the coursework. And that's just one example. That's a, one that we all understand. Uh, but the, the same thing applies with math uh, as you move from one state to another. Uh, some parents find themselves uh, where the kids are being moved into a, a, a level of uh, performance that they're unready for or they're moving back a few years. And they really get concerned with their juniors and seniors because it obviously affects their viability for college. So this is a big issue. And, and again, in, in many ways, it, uh, it certainly drives where, where service members choose to go in many ways, but it also affects, again, retention. So to the degree we can elevate that and work together on it, all the better. So a lot of work to do still to get it pushed in the, in the direction that you're looking for at this Absolutely. particular point. Absolutely. And then, again, at the state level, I mean, for all those of you who represent the 40 or so states that are out there, is we, we really need action at the state level to accept, uh, re reciprocate, if you will, in terms, of, uh, in terms of what kids have studied, our military kids have studied other schools, and, and help close that gap. And there are other areas, too. I mean, we have challenges, if you will, for uh, homeschooled kids in terms of state recognition of, of what they've done and all that. So we have a whole list of things. I'm sure we can come back to you and give you more detail, but it, it is a challenge for us. So we're, we, uh, we're extremely honored that you agreed to take the time out. I know that you're a busy man and that you're, we respect your time. So I'm gonna ask you one last question. We've talked a little bit about spouse licensing, we've reciprocity, we've talked about education, housing, et cetera. So if you could stand here in front of each one of these community leaders out here today and say, here's what I need you to do to support soldiers and their families, what would that message be? It would be to work with your businesses, work with your employers to hire our spouses. It's that simple. I know they may only be there for three years or four years, but they're fantastic people. They are sacrificing for our country. I like to say that the, the hardest job in the Army is being an Army spouse uh, because they have to pick up and move every two or three or four years. They often raise the kids without the help of the other spouse. Uh, they're very industrious, hardworking, committed to the job. You'll get a very loyal worker. And yes, I get it. I worked in the private sector. You may have to find another one in three years. But the quality that you will get, the commitment that you will get, the service that you will commit get during those three years will be outstanding. So I ask you, look at your policies, look at your practices, talk to your chambers of commerce, talk to your folks in, uh, in town, and, and ask them, really encourage them to hire uh, our spouses, especially the professionals, the nurses, the, the lawyers, the paralegals, the others who are looking for work. That's all they want is a fair shot and a fair job and to do their share. In many cases, they need the work. In, in, in many other cases, they simply want to contribute and, and fulfill their own professional aspirations. So doing that makes a big difference. That's why the Secretary of Air Force and Navy and I wrote a letter saying that that, that factor will be a, a, an important one as we consider uh, both where we locate new bases and when we decide to close bases and installations. That's going to be a critical factor for us. So, Sir, thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much for your important message to our communities. And come back any time that, you, uh, that you're, you're always welcome at Association of Defense Communities. Thank you, and thank you all for what you do. Cool.